So, today uh, we'll begin this talk by some data collection. So the talk is indeed about eye tracking. I'm particularly interested in the measure of the pupil and analysis of changes in pupil diameter as a function of uh, whatever we do to our participants. But general eye tracking principles and practical aspects will be discussed. Uh, now, what would be interesting is to make it available to the masses. So I'll present some uh, solutions about making your own eye trackers that you can find online. And I've actually made one for this talk that we're going to be able to look at and actually try out with free software. So everything we're going to do today costs, indeed, about 40 quid with some leftover parts if you want to make a second one. Um, I'll talk about the issue of uh, data manipulation, how you visualize eye tracking and pupil data analysis, um, what's done currently and how there are serious limitations and challenges with how people look at eye tracking data. And then finally we'll look at your data which we're going to provide in a moment uh, as a, uh, an illustration of how specifically we can use pupil diameter to measure cognitive processes. So. We'll do a brief experiment. There are eye trackers hidden everywhere, so you know uh, you don't need to sign up because the data will be destroyed at the end of the talk. Uh, but if you'll bear with me and look at the screen, I'm going to give you um, some instructions. You'll see six simple arithmetic problems where you'll be asked to add two numbers, two three-digit numbers. Uh, you'll see each problem for 10 seconds. Don't copy on your neighbor because they'll probably get it wrong anyway and you'll be embarrassed. Um, try and solve them out loud without listening to your neighbors. So it's very important that you do try and solve these simple problems. So if you are ready, I'll show you some very simple math you can do. So in an eye tracking experiment, there would be something like a fixation point. You get people to look at the screen and when they look, either automatically after some period of time or as a function of their looking. You then begin the trial and I'll give you the first one. Out loud, please. Three, two, one, eight. Another one. Out loud, everyone. Ready? And again. Final answer. So there are no hidden eye trackers, and unfortunately, this sort of seminar doesn't allow me to see participants beforehand and do a quick recording so we could look at their data, but I've done this before. I've got data from people like you who were shown these sums and enjoyed them, and we'll look at them at the end, but now you have a sense of what the task was about, and after the technical presentation, uh, maybe the data will be subjectively as well as technically meaningful. So eye tracking generally has a very basic idea. You have someone looking at something and you have to figure out where they look. Uh, most current techniques have uh, a screen, usually a computer screen. There will be a camera somewhere either attached to the screen, near the screen, or mounted on the participant's head so you have to screw them in. Uh, but then you use essentially a bunch of algorithms to figure out based on the camera image where the person is looking at the screen. And that's very useful if you study re uh, reading, parsing visual scenes, and so forth. So when you do eye tracking, usually you're interested in this gaze point, which is your estimate of where, in a particular visual scene, your participant is looking. Um, 
you will use procedures generally based on corneal reflection, where essentially there is a light spot on the surface of the eye that's reflected, that's perceived by the camera, and used to assess the point of gaze of your participants. Uh, the pupil in the eye tends to be dark in normal lighting position, so that's one of the ways you can assess the position of the eye and find this dark pupil. But sometimes for practical reasons, and especially if you work with babies, you find that using a white pupil is easier, and you do that by throwing light into the eyeball in such a way that it's reflected out and the camera picks up a white rather than a dark pupil. Um, so you have this camera, which is usually an infrared camera, using infrared light emitting diodes to generate this corneal reflection. Uh, you'll measure the eye and through a series of various algorithms you'll make an assessment as to where's the pupil, where's the light reflected as well near the pupil, and use the posi relative position of the tooth to assess roughly where the eye is pointing at. So if you're looking up, for example, the reflected lights will be relatively lower to the pupil. If you're looking down, the reflected light will be relatively higher in the pup of, of the pupil and so forth. So this way you can assess how the, how the eye is moving and make an estimate of what the person may be looking at. So if you have <coughs> very dark eyes and you struggle to distinguish the pupil from the iris, and that's not always a problem, but when it is, and for some reason it is with babies, you could use an extra illuminator to throw infrared light into the eye. It doesn't affect perception of participants because they can't see it, but the camera will pick it up and it will brighten up the pupil in such a way that makes it easier to measure. So it's the same principle as when you have pictures after a night out where the flash got everyone's eyes to come out quite vampires. Uh, so pupil diameter. Uh, well, <coughs> the primary function of uh, the pupil, which is essentially the opening in the middle of the iris, is to modulate how much light reaches the retina. So uh, you've probably experienced that already looking at yourself in the mirror, where if you look up and you're looking at a slightly brighter area of the room, you'll see your pupil contract, and if it gets darker, the pupil dilates. You may have observed it with other people. So the main function uh, is uh, made possible by the pupillary light reflex, which dilates the iris in darkened condition and constricts it in rather bright condition. Now, there is a function, and function isn't always what it's uh, meant to be when people talk about function. Uh, but the iris apparently indexes mental load, attention, arousal. These are all very vague terms. But essentially, if people get excited or get very busy in a task, uh, <coughs> the pupil uh, increases in diameter. Now, it so happens that there's a brainstem structure called the locus carillus that's uh, involved in attention, vigilance, and so forth. And when it's active, it releases norepinephrine, which happens to be a hormone that the iris responds to and dilates when there's some in the ambient environment. So uh, the idea that you would dilate your pupil to be more uh, involved with whatever you're doing is actually the wrong way around. You happen to be aroused, attentive, and so forth. It releases a particular chemical that happens to dilate the pupil. So <coughs> you've heard about the eyes as the windows to the soul, where they're more like the window into the brainstem. Um, this citation of the eyes being the window to the soul uh, has many alleged sources. A frequent one is Cicero, uh, Roman politician uh, from a long time ago. But it has been well known, and for example, courtesans in Italian medieval times would use a substance that actually dilates the pupil to appear more interested in when they were courting other people. And it was sort of a customary to do that. Um, people working in optometry, ophthalmology, have been aware of uh, the pupil light reflex for a number of times. But as far as psychology and cognition is concerned, uh, mm -hmm. The interest is about from 50-odd years ago when S. and Polk 
showed naked picture to people and found that the pupil dilated to naked pictures. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, because I'm a developmental person, um, someone called Fitzgerald in the late 60s did uh, pupil dilation measures of babies. And the problem at the time is that they were shooting with infrared uh, physical film at a frequency of two hertz. They had to send it to Kodak to have it developed, and then it was sent back to them, and they would use a projector and a screen and a ruler to actually measure pupil diameter uh, at two hertz. So they found some interesting stuff, but the technology of the time made it just too much of a hassle to pursue it. So it was a good 30 years before the pupil was back in the field of infancy research. Um, Bruno Lang did a wonderful study um, he was interested, uh, prompted by an interview with uh, them. Um, the American uh, cinematographer who did the original Hairspray, uh, something, Waters? John, um, John Waters? Yes, John Waters. I had Roger Waters in mind, but <laughs> no, it's not Pink Floyd. So uh, John Waters said, in an interview asked about what sort of film he'd like to do and he answered, I'd like to do a porn film but without sex scenes. And Bruno found that very funny and he thought, can I do a study about sex without actually mentioning sex? So what he did is he got a sample of women who uh, had boyfriends and asked them to come over and bring a picture of their boyfriend, uh, identify their favorite ce celebrity with whom they would possibly wish to enjoy uh, an exceptional time um, and so forth. They had pictures of uh, faculty uh, who were deemed to be average looking and so forth. So they put all these pictures together and women in the sample would look at their own boyfriend, their own favorite celebrities, the celebrities of others, the boyfriends of others and the staff and so forth. And this was done at three times as a function of where they were in their hormonal cycle and lo and behold the only effect they found in pupil diameter is when women looked at their own boyfriend, not other people's, their own celebrities, not other people's celebrities, when they were ovulating. So they possibly wouldn't have been able to say anything about whether or not they are more fond of their own boyfriend relative to their own celebrity at particular times of the month, but this seemed to be an interesting sort of measure of in this case, you know, uh, uh, psychological arousal without ever mentioning anything. So I think, uh, I didn't quite catch it. Um, when they're ovulating, both the boyfriend and the celebrity are getting there. Yeah, but only their own. Yeah, right. Yeah. Not the celebrity, the staff. The so you go about measuring things like that, whether it's people diameter or. Uh, gaze tracking using a variety of equipment. Uh, very common is this idea that there's a chin rest somewhere because you want to immobilize the head uh, of your participants to make measurements as uh, reliable as possible. But that doesn't quite work with babies. I do babies and I wish I didn't because they're horrible, horrible participants. Uh, but there are methods with them where essentially the eye tracker is remotely uh, uh, involved relative to the babies, and there's some degree of tolerance for head movements. Um, and then there's this stuff which looks like um, items from the torture museum, where you essentially screw some sort of headgear onto people, and they have their cameras measuring their eyes very near. Um, however you do it will also depend on what other things you might be doing in your lab. If you're doing EEG recording, you need presumably a stimulus computer that will deal with presenting uh, whatever you're showing participants, various computers to record uh, whatever you're recording, but also uh, crosstalk between your machines so that everyone has a reliable timestamp so that when you actually analyze the data, you're aware of exactly when whatever happened happened and across different systems. So good luck with that when you reach that stage of lab development. It's a lot of fun. Uh, regardless of this setup, what you need to do when you do eye tracking is essentially calibrate the eye tracker to individual participants. People vary in the shape of their eyeballs. They vary 
and the distance between eyes if you're actually measuring both eyes um, and so forth. You need stimuli to show people and you need events that you'll use as codes to analyze the data further, further, um, further down. Moreover, as, as discussed in the previous slide, if you have different equipment simultaneously recording other things with participants, you need to be able to sync your events across systems. Now when you do eye tracking, you can click record at the beginning of your experiment and click stop at the end and figure out what to do with the large stream of data at the end. Um, another way to do it, which in some cases is quite preferable, is to make the uh, unfolding of the experiment as a function of where people look. So you can start trials at arbit arbitrary times, but then the length of the trial or the essentially temporal unfolding of events can be a function of where participants look. These are two things you can do with eye tracking. For example, the math problems we did earlier, you could have the fixation point for a specific time. It can be triggered uh, to the next trial by the experimenter, or you could have the participant trigger the trial when they've looked at that crosshair for, say, 100 milliseconds. Now, if you want to set up an eye tracking lab using commercial equipment out there, it's very easy to spend upwards of £30,000 uh, to get the equipment and the software and the licenses and the on-site install uh, from some manufacturers, uh, which puts many people off uh, eye tracking or incapable of getting pilot data to eventually get a gr grant for eye tracking work. So it turns out that you can do it very, very cheaply. It works reasonably well, but I finished building the eye tracker for the talk on Monday, so I've not had a chance to do much better than long gamma testing. Um, but we'll see how it works. So the first options, and there are links to the slides, and I believe they make these slides available after, is a head-mounted eye tracker, and it's the one I'll be showing you today. Uh, I have a link to um, a PDF file that explains how to build it. Um, I plan to make a similar walkthrough, which uh, might help people with some problems I've encountered when I followed those instructions. But the original source of the idea um, is from that link. And there's a group of people, I think these are Swedish people, who have made very interesting software to use with off-the-shelf webcam-based eye trackers. Uh, we'll look at that again in a moment. And there's another option, because I don't want to sell one in particular. I have no vested interest. I use one that seems simple enough to make a model for today. And again, uh, other Scandinavian people have made uh, software to use with that particular eye tracking solution. Uh, what I'll show, and I'll show also the problems, is a head-mounted solution. It has a particular problem where the moment you move your head with respect to the camera, the world is shifted, so the calibration becomes a bit weak. Um, what you might want to use is a remote eye tracker, which is fixed in position relative to the screen, but then you have the converse problem of figuring out how to uh, accommodate the movements of the head if you want to figure out where people are looking. But again, software options available. So I'll show you one that I've built. I'll show you that it actually works, unless I have problems on the way over. It worked last night. Um, and it's relatively sil simple. So it's a head-mounted gear. And rather than go for this uh, vice grip type hat, I went for glasses. Uh, you could get cycling glasses that have removable lenses. It's great because you don't want lenses. You go to spec savers and get empty frames if you want. Uh, that's fine. What you want is the least bit of frame uh, around the eye. You could go to Fred Alders and get some aluminum wire. You could go to Maplin to get some heat shrink tubing, and you'll have everything you need for the head mount aspect of the eye tracker. Uh, it's an infrared eye tracker, so you need uh, infrared light sources, and you can build them using a uh, simple resistor and um, LEDs you can buy at Maplins for the cheap, on the cheap. And also you need an infrared filter, which is quite expensive, but if you go to the photo counter at Booth and ask them for the end of a developed thing, you actually have, free of charge, 
an infrared filter that you can use to modify your camera. And finally, you need a webcam. Uh, I got this off eBay for twelve fifty eight. It's discontinued, which is annoying, but it's a good webcam for that very purpose. Especially, yeah, we need to take it apart. So, if you think you might build an eye tracker, act quickly. They're hard to find on Google Shop. So, <coughs> essentially, I spent forty pounds seventy uh, pence on this project. I have about ninety two cable ties left, and maybe 50 centimeters of aluminum wire so and some heat shrink tubing as well so i'm well equipped for a second eye tracker for less than 40 pounds so uh, what you need a webcam is uh, quite cute but if you want a head mounted eye tracker that big plastic ball will get in the way so you want to actually strip it and remove the bits you need you'll find a screw at the back and after much effort and swearing you are re able to remove the casing there are two screws holding the circuit board there's a microphone wire that you don't need because you're not using the microphone of the webcam and very soon you have a printed circuit board that's your camera and the necessary electronics to actually capture video now you need to turn this camera into an infrared camera to do eye tracking uh, the lens on screws which is very convenient and what you find on the back of the unscrewed bit is what's called a natural light filter which is a slightly thickish bit of plastic that you can remove and will possibly as I did break if you remove that's fine because you don't need it and once you've removed it you can cut out from your negative thumb uh, a little strip that's about the size of the filter you've removed put it back uh, where you remove the natural light filter, screw it back on. Uh, you need LEDs in the infrared range to actually illuminate uh, your eyes. So a bit of soldering will get you going. And eventually you'll be able to put it together uh, using uh, the electrical current from the USB cable to illuminate the eyes. So <coughs> the reason we go infrared is that it makes it much easier to identify the pupil relative to the iris, and it works also with hazel brown eyes. Uh, from the original cameras, this is the sort of image you would get. I tried to do them all in the same lighting conditions. Uh, if you remove the natural light filter, it looks a bit like this. So clearly, uh, cameras need some sort of filtering to normally do their job. If you add this little strip of negative film between the lens and the uh, photoreceptor array of the camera, uh, it doesn't look that much different. But when you eliminate, you get a very, very nicely distinguished uh, pupil from the eye. Um, tested it last night with a uh, darker iris person. It works just as well. And that will allow you to use the software that figures out where and what size is the pupil. Uh, you'll need the aluminum wire that's uh, of a nice enough gauge that it will remain rigid. Um, now you want your saying to look nice, so this heat shrink tubing not only uh, I, uh, insulates the little arm of the eye tracker, it also makes it look nice and professional. Uh, you may wish to screw the, uh, uh, the circuit board to the end of the arm, but that requires a drill, uh, which I didn't have. Glue's fine, so long as you find glue that's uh, non-conductive and non-corrosive, you should be fine. And finally, if you're so inclined, you could cover up the electronics with electrical tape. Slowly but surely, you'll be building an eye tracker. Uh, you want to plug in and attach the USB connection to the camera and the cables feed into this little plastic thing that's got space for you to push in your lead array and get power for it using the red and black cables. You could cover it again with tape, attach your uh, fancy looking heat shrink tubing uh, camera arm to the glasses with tie cables and pretty soon you have your very own eye tracker that you can start playing with. And what we'll do is actually look at one uh, so 40 quid uh, why are people paying 
thousand of pounds for eye tracking. Well, it's all in the packaging itself. By all means, I could probably sell this on eBay now for about 500 because of the nice exciting packaging. Uh, but we will switch to a demo just now. But what I'll do when I swap computers is actually take it out and pass it around. Um, and you can actually try it on, see how comfortable it is. And the only thing you might want to do is be careful with the camera and the light is not there. It's bordering on comfortable. Mm. It's bordering on the glasses, like, just like glasses. So after a little while, it'll get more or less uh, forgettable as far as wearing it. And you can actually uh, start recording data. So we'll swap computers because this requires software. That Uh, but yeah, there's some nice people. And the research community is divided between the, uh, uh, you know, there's no other way to say it, but the uh, ambitious ones who will sell everything, including their students, and the more open source uh, communist types who believe that knowledge is just something you share with other people. And thanks to people like that, you find incredibly useful software out there. It's not in the talk because I found it after I sent my slide to Claire, uh, but this Ogama, not to confuse with some American presidents, uh, is a suite of uh, very useful modules to record and analyze eye tracking data. I'm sorry? That doesn't need to do it online? Yeah, yeah. Um, I might send, uh, I, don't, I don't know when Claire will put them online, but I'll possibly send updated slides with links to this particular software suite because uh, uh, I just found it. Uh, you need to install um, the point .NET 4 framework, uh, which is free from Microsoft and SQL Express. It works uh, as a database server. Well, it's really, really good. Uh, so it was some faff, but then I played with it yesterday. I was like, yeah, I've got nice commercial eye trackers in my lab, and they don't look much better than that as far as the you know, flexibility. So very quickly, I've got a very simple task that's just meant to uh, record some stuff and play it back. And anyone who's interested after, you're welcome to come be calibrated and try it out. Uh, so I created this project, I just want to plug it in beforehand. I've not tested it on other machines and this laptop, which is in effect a gaming laptop, happens to be very powerful and works well, so maybe on more, you know, uh, medium range laptops this might struggle. only had a couple of days to experiment with this. So, I want to record data, which takes me to this data recording module. Uh, I want to connect to the eye tracker. I've had to install this gaze tracker software, which actually works with this. And you can see that my eye is being tracked by the camera process data, which is slightly more CPU intensive, will actually highlight the identification of the iris and point of gaze. Now one problem, if you've been following, is that at the moment, wherever I look, uh, the camera works well at tracking my eye. So 
So if I calibrate relative to a fixed area in space, the moment I move my head, we've lost calibration, which can be quite annoying. So when you do that, and that's something I plan to explore in the future, uh, you might want to use the webcam on the laptop to figure out where the participant's looking, uh, use reference point on the glasses to actually compensate for head movement, but with only a few days, uh, I'm not quite there. Uh, I'll be a new subject to the experiment. You can specify all sorts of things you might want to specify about participants and comments and so forth. Now, what I need to do is calibrate. Like I mentioned earlier, each person you would measure in the night tracking experiment has unique characteristic with respect to the shape of their eyes and so forth. Uh, yes, so I can't move after. The calibration essentially involves a series of points that the computer will display on the screen whilst it's recording where my eye moves to and makes an estimate of the position of my eye as a function of where I'm expected to be looking. So this is what we've got at the moment. It's not especially good. As you see right now, I'm looking at the continue button, just moving my head. So it is recording my eye and tracking my gaze. So if we do this experiment now, I can record. Oh no. Are you seeing what I'm doing right now? Yes. Okay. Are you seeing that screen, the welcome screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So what I'm doing now is just following these dots around, and hopefully that's what it'll look like when we play back later. Now there's a bunch of X's, but I want to look specifically at the O, which would be an oddball for doing an object search task. Here we go. So n nothing exciting about this task, um, but I can show you the data recording of subject three, I believe. looking up and now I should be looking at the O and the O. So <coughs> this is a, a sort of a cheap solution. Um, the fact that it's cheap is not why we have this problem where you lose calibration. It's because it's head mounted. So you would need algorithms to actually compensate for head movement or a chin and forehead rest, where at least you try and immobilize the head of participants from calibration to the end of recording. But otherwise, this looks pretty much like what you do and get and require for my tracking experiment. I'll leave it on, and if anyone wants to try it after the talk, then by all means, you're more than welcome. So, when you record data, and I could have shown you as well, uh, what you get is a bunch of numbers, uh, many, many times per second, depending on your sampling rate, that have to do with all sorts of measurements performed by the eye tracker, estimates of gaze position, estimates of pupil diameter. So there's lots of numbers to actually shrink down to something useful. If you're doing anything to do with reading or general visual scene analysis, something that people are really interested in are fixations. And the fixation is when the point of gaze remains within uh, a smallish area for a minimum amount of time. So when people read uh, essentially 
point of gaze will shift from word to word at particular intervals as people read. Uh, more fancy, obviously, is looking at sequences of fixation. You could do that where you have an error in some text that you want people to pick up on and you'll be looking at where they go back because they've misread, for example. Um, you could have conditions whereby you expect some people to be slower or quicker than others and so forth. Uh, heat maps are very good to give you an idea of, of what's interesting in a particular image if you've recorded data from several people. Essentially, you overlay uh, the image with a sort of shading based on the amount of time that people have spent in particular areas. Um, now, <coughs> as much as it was born out of research, the main users and buyers of eye trackers nowadays are market research companies that are very keen to figure out where to put that ketchup on the shelf. Heat maps are very useful when you're looking at various ways to put products on shelves in a store. Um, there are uh, marketing research companies that have eye trackers embedded in shopping carts and have fake shopping centers where they'll send people on a uh, shopping mission in order to record where and how they look at things to sort of uh, essentially, essentially uh, sell more soap. Uh, what I've been doing in is using pupil diameter, and I'm particularly interested in how it changes over time as you show events that may have moments of interest to participants. I'm studying babies. Babies don't talk. You can't ask them questions, so therefore I show them some video sequences where at specific times there will be something that happens that's meant to reveal some ability in some conditions or the lack of some ability in other conditions. And I want to see in time whether or not I'm picking up on anything in information processing that's indexed by pupil diameter. So what I use is uh, curve fitting, specifically splines, to express, uh, uh, not to express, but to summarize the data I get from babies, and I perform statistical analysis on these curves. So my t-test or my f-test is not a number, but a curve as well expressed over time. And I can look at when, in a particular sequence of information processing, I might find differences between conditions. Um, the simplest of overviews, but we can look at the data as would have been recorded when we did some uh, sums at the beginning of this talk. So you've probably figured out that some problems were easy and some problems were hard, and that was based simply on the fact that some had no carryover and some had only carryovers. And within 10 seconds, if you're trying to do it well, because you tell people that you know most people can solve these problems, people get quite flustered. And, uh, but in 10 seconds, very few people actually add successfully with three at the bottom, just because you have to carry over everywhere. So <coughs> this is data I recorded just before a similar presentation using an actual eye tracker. And this is the average pupil diameter, or the change in pupil diameter over these six trials. <coughs> so just before uh, the numbers appear, uh, because pupil diameter vary between people, I have a sort of baseline measure of pupil diameter, and then I look at the change in pupil diameter when they solve the six problems. So it looks relatively similar, but then when you look at the mean pupil diameter for easy and hard problems, you find that when you introduce an easy problem, people get excited, they figure out they can solve it, they give the answer, and then they somewhat relax. Uh, but when people are working on the hard problems that they can't solve within you know, 10 seconds of the trial, the diameter of the pupil relative to baseline remains high throughout the whole trial. So that's an illustration of how we use pu pupil diameter as an index of information processing. Uh, because all six trials have three-digit numbers, they don't really vary much with respect to luminance of the stimuli. So any change in pupil diameter here can reasonably be assumed to index mental effort of some kind. And we split them in easy and hard, and lo and behold, the data looks like what you would expect. Uh, as far as further reading goes, um, if you're interested in pupil diameter, which is the thing I've been working on, I've got a, a 
review paper out with the green line, the snap green dot, and you can look at the history and general issues relating to glucometry. What I like to do is functional analysis rather than uh, essentially take nice, rich temporal data and reduce it to a number. I like to look at data evolving over time when I perform analysis on functions rather than discrete data values. So a paper out there that describes the method is the prime use, use for it. And the other thing we found with pupil diameter is that so far all commercial systems we've looked at fail to compensate for point of gaze when we estimate pupil diameter. So if I look at you head on, my pupil will be this roundish thing. But if I look sideways, it will narrow into an elliptical shape. If I look upwards, it will narrow as well in an elliptical shape. So depending on which algorithm you use, you will underestimate uh, pupil diameter when it goes in a particular direction. Uh, it's easy to compensate. If you know where people are looking at, you expect that the ellipse is actually a circle. You have to compensate for the fact that they're looking left, right, up, or down. But incredibly, uh, commercial system vendors have not built in gaze compensation to estimate the pupil diameter. And we found systematic errors. They're not tragic. They're actually uh, quite um, uh, their linear function of gaze that you can fix them. But it's good stuff to know.